Good evening, folks. Randy Stone here, bringing you a tale from the dark alleys of the theater world. Tonight's episode, Twill Be the Death of Me, takes us behind the curtains where ambition and revenge play the leading roles. Join me as we unravel the story of Charles Kelsey, a theatrical producer with a score to settle, and Max Sorensen, a Shakespearean actor caught in a web of intrigue. A plot filled with twists, a stage set for betrayal, and lines delivered with a sting. This is drama at its finest, now remastered for your listening pleasure. So grab your seat, dim the lights, and tune in to this classic episode of Nightbeat. And if this tale of suspense has you on the edge of your seat, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. The night is young, and the stories are endless. Join me, Randy Stone, as we explore the mysteries of the night. Click the link below and let the drama unfold. Night speed. Hi, this is Randy Stone. I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. Stories begin in many different ways. This one began when a man who wanted to play king and ended with a real king taking top billing. Old King Death. Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. Chicago's theatrical district at night is a river of light, flashing marquees and gay crowds. But through it flows a deep current of hunger and disenchantment, illusion and hope. Yes, hope forever dying, but never quite dead. There was hope, a strained threadbare hope on old Max Saracen's face as I crossed Randolph Street and saw him buttonholing Charles Kelsey. Kelsey's a play producer currently more famous for the frequency of his marriages than those of his stage hits. As I strolled up, Max had one hand on Kelsey's arm, his gaunt, bearded face eager and anxious. You should have notified me, Charles. I certainly would have appeared at the tryouts if I'd known they were being held. Surely it's not too late. I'm sorry, old boy. Oh, hello there, Randy. Hiya, Charlie. Hello, Max. Charles, listen. You know my work. Remember my performances in the Theatre Guild Shakespeare Festival. Me King Lear, me Richard III... Were yes, yes, Max, yes, yes, but that was over 20 years ago. And it was I who asked that grand old man of the theatre, Frank Gaydosh, to take you on as an assistant. If it weren't for Can't me... you understand? Henry IV has already been cast. Well, what do you do with a fellow like this, Rand? Henry IV? Don't tell me Shakespeare on Randolph Street. Why not? In modern dress and a few sensational innovations that I promise you, Randy, will make Chicago sit up and take notice. Well, maybe you got something, Kelsey. I promise you they will sit up and take notice, Charles, if I do King Henry for you. It cannot be too late. Oh. You sit yourself, it'll... Max Saracen paid no attention to me. His haunted eyes were fixed on Charles Kelsey, and his tall, angular figure towered over us as he pleaded with the producer. The old actor had a single track mind, but I could see that as far as Kelsey was concerned, it was going in the wrong direction. It embarrassed me to hear him plead with Kelsey for the old man at once was great. Spears kings from Priam to Claudius. I've said all I've got to say to you tonight, Max. Now, if you'll kindly remove your hand from my arm. I'm not asking for any major part, Charles. The part of the king is fairly minor in this play, but it was made for me. Max, for the last time. Charles, please, I need it. Oh, you old relic, you. Do I have to use thoughts? Oh, cut out the rough stuff, Kelsey. Don't move! Nay, hold! The old man changed before my very eyes. It was frightening. He was suddenly a giant, taller and broader than I'd ever seen him, the stoop in his back gone and rage blazing from a face of iron. He stood like a king in majestic wrath, his eyes darting about until he spotted Charles Kelsey pushing his way through the crowd. Hold, you foul fat-witted dog! Stop! Max, wait! Keep away! Take your hands off, Max. Don't be a fool. I'm warning you, Max. I don't want to... Max, stop it. Stop it. You're killing him. Max staggered back as I drove my shoulder into his chest, and Kelsey dropped to the pavement, still kicking. I hurried Max across the street where my car was parked and took off just as a cop showed up. When we got out of traffic, I headed out Sheridan Road along the lake. A nice cool breeze blowing off the water, Max. Feel better? Why, uh, why yes, yes, I, I feel all right. You're, uh, you're Randy Stone, the journalist. Who did you think it was? I, uh, I just didn't, uh, 
What happened? What do you mean, what happened? You had a little argument. Max, look at me. Don't you remember? Oh, what time is it? Wait, it's, uh, it's nearly eight. Oh, I'm late. How could I have forgotten? What? I was going to see Mr. Kelsey, Charles Kelsey. You know, the producer. Oh, I see. He's opening with the production of Henry IV. You've probably heard about it. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, look, Max, uh, why don't you join me in a bite to eat at Mr. Joe's? What do you say? Why, uh, what time did you say it is? It's about eight. Eight. Uh, he often works late, yes, of course, uh, my dear lad, would you mind dropping me by Charles Kelsey's office on uh, Randolph Street, the Warwick Building? I may catch him yet. Well, look, we can call him up and... Uh, oh Eh? What is it? A police car just pulled in behind us. Some ego scout must have taken down my license number. What do you mean? Why? Max Harrison. I, yes, I'm he. All right, climb out. What? I... Now, look, officer. What's the meaning of this? The meaning is you're under arrest. They bundled Max into their car and drove off. I tailed them to headquarters where Max was booked for a simple assault, uh, a misdemeanor, and held on $50 bail. I found a telephone and called up Max's home. His wife answered. She broke down when I told her what had happened. Well, how could he? He was depending so much on getting a part of Mr. Kelsey's play. It meant everything. Well, Max isn't well, Mrs. Saracen. The quicker you get him to a doctor, the better off he'll be. I can't, I can't. I haven't got fifty dollars. We haven't anything, Mister Stone. Why well, there isn't even any food in the house. Oh, uh... oh Max, he's been going crazy trying to make ends meet, trying to pay my doctor's bills. Well, look, don't uh, don't worry now. I'll see what can be done. Well, what could I do? Not much. So I went to the office. I touched a few of the boys for a five here, a ten there, until I had it. Then I went back to headquarters. The desk sergeant stared at the money. What's this? Max Harrison's bail. You can turn him loose. I turned him loose about 20 minutes ago. What? Sure. Kelsey dropped the charges. Oh, I see. He <laughs> must have finally figured out which side his publicity was butted on. Max, go home? I don't think so. Kelsey sent a limousine over to pick him up. He wants to see him. Kelsey? Wants to see Max? Well, that's what the chauffeur said. You know, Stone, I'm beginning to wonder if I did the right thing. The old man didn't seem right in the head. I'm kind of worried. You're worried. So long, Sergeant. Hey, where are you going? To Kelsey's office before Max kills him. I couldn't imagine why Charles Kelsey would want to tempt fate by bringing Max to his office. But whatever the reason, I was too fond of the old actor to have him run the risk of killing a man. I rushed to the Warwick building, went up to the 10th floor where Kelsey maintained his offices. I was about to go in when the door jerked open. Max Saracen shuffled out, pushing past me blindly, and I grabbed his arm. Hey, Max. Eh? Huh? Oh, oh, Randy. What is it? What happened? Huh? Oh, 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 nothing. Why? What did Kelsey want to see you about? He, he offered me a job. <laughs> a job. Max. Yes? What kind of a job? Playing, playing a part. What kind of a part? I can't tell you. Please let go of me, Randy. No, no, wait a minute, Max. Now, wait a minute. What's the big mystery? What what kind of a job is this going to be, anyway? <laughs> would be the death of me. <laughs> now, please, let go of my arm, Randy. <laughs> the death of me. Max. And now, back to Nightbeat and Randy Stone. After Max Saracen had publicly humiliated Charles Kelsey by attacking him in the street, I didn't think the producer was going to offer Max a job without some kind of a catch to it. And when Max emerged from Kelsey's office, I could see by his face that I was right. The old actor was crushed. I barged into Kelsey's office to find out for myself and to warn him that he was playing with dynamite. Mr. Stone, no man or woman for that matter can cross me with impunity. I keep books and I settle all accounts. Every slight, every blow, every insult. I keep a record of them all, Mr. Stone. I overlook nothing and I repay with interest. What satisfaction is there getting even with someone who doesn't even know what he did to it? You expect me to be believed? Your that? mind is so narrow it squeezes right through the facts. I'll remember that. I wish you would. Max is a sick man. Now, what kind of a job did you give him? Now, let's have it. <laughs> Take your hands off. I asked you. Why is he so upset? Disappointment. What else? He wanted a part of King Henry. All I could give him was the job of understudy. Understudy? Then why the secrecy? The old hand fancies himself another Barrymore. 
He doesn't want it known that he's had to accept the part of a mere understudy. It's quite obvious, isn't it? Mm. Just, uh, when is this show going to open? Oh, in three or four months, I imagine. You're satisfied? Now get out. Yes, I'll be happy to, just as soon as you tell me who's going to play financial angel to your Shakespearean clam bake now that your wife has separated her bankroll from it. My wife and I have suffered long enough from the malicious lies of scandal mongers like you, Mr. Stone. Oh, yes, yes, uh, I know. Uh, what about that well-known scandal sheet, the court record? That separation suit was faked, I suppose. Mrs. Kelsey has reconsidered since then. Oh, well, congratulations. You stay married to her long enough, you too can be in the social register. The social register. I'd express an opinion on that point, Stone, but not to you. My wife's passion for blue blood is a foible outside the realm of this discussion. However, if it uh, helps convince you that we've solved our differences, you might note that we're entertaining tonight with a little reception in honor of Count Raphael de Guidio. Oh, where did Max go when he left here? How do I know? Now, will you get out of here? Yes, with pleasure. I need a little fresh air. Oh, hello, Mrs. Saracen. Yes? It's Randy Stone again. Oh. Has Max gotten home yet? No. Uh, no, he'll be home late. He's dining out. What's that? He, he called up a little while ago. I guess you know what happened, don't you? It was awfully generous of Mr. Kelsey. The whole thing was a mistake. He never meant to have Max arrested. But I do appreciate your concern for Max. It was good of you to call me. Uh, look, who is Max dining with? Why, it was Mr. Kelsey at his home. He wants to discuss a part with Max for his Henry IV. It's a wonderful break. Just what we've been hoping for. Max was all choked up with emotion when he told me about it. It's about time. Poor darling. So Kelsey had actually invited Max over to his home. Why? What kind of web was he weaving for the old actor? Whatever it was, I knew it. Had only one purpose in Kelsey's twisted mind, to destroy Max Saracen, to get even. I got into my car and headed for the Gold Coast where Kelsey lived. I pulled up in the courtyard, went to the door, flashed my press card to the butler. Thank you, sir. I believe you'll find most of the press people in the next room by the punch bowl. Oh, thank you for the tip, but I'm looking for one special character, Max Saracen. Have you seen him? Saracen, sir? I No, sir, I do not believe... All right, I'll look around. He's probably somewhere in that mob on the ballroom floor. I think not, sir. There has been no Mr. Saracen. I've let in everyone, sir, and there's been no one by that name. That's quite definite, sir. I would remember a name like that. Yes, well, I'll look anyway, thank you. I shouldered my way through all that soup and fish, feeling as conspicuous in my everyday clothes as a burglar at a policeman's convention. Where was Max? I glanced from one face to another. There must have been nearly 300 of them there. Was he in another part of the house? Had he come in by another entrance? I couldn't be sure. Kelly, Kelsey was nowhere to be seen either. If he was alone with Max, there was no telling what would happen. I spotted Mrs. Kelsey over with a group of females clustered about the guest of honor. I was heading in her direction for information when a voice behind me brought me up short. Stone! Well, what are you doing here? I'm slumming, Kelsey. Where's Max? I know he was coming here. Charles! Well, it's about time you were arriving. Whatever's been keeping you? I've been tied up at the office, and then I had to get dressed. Oh, uh, Edith, this is Mr. Stone, the Chicago star. My wife. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, Charles, the Count has been here for quite some time now. Come on and meet him. Hurry. Kelsey, as soon as you're through, I'd like a word oh, on you. Oh, Mr. Stone, you really should meet the Count Raphael de Guidio yourself. He's just arrived from Barcelona, and he's truly one of the most delightful and charming gentlemen I've ever met. A true aristocrat. Yes, it'll be a pleasure, I'm sure. Uh, this may. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, poor man. Just look at him over there behind those palms. Where? I don't see him. Oh, over there, in the midst of all those women. <laughs> They're simply devouring him. <laughs> oh, Count Raphael. We'd better go round. Here he is. Oh, Count Gideon. Ah, uh, Signora Kelsey. I am... Oh. The Count de Gideon stood staring at me. A red ribbon of honor, three medals decorating his magnificent dress coat. In fact, any way you looked at him, he was a magnificent figure of a man with a magnificent snow-white Van Dyke beard, every inch an aristocrat. Except, of course, he wasn't the Count de Guidio at all. He was Max Saracen. 
My husband, Charles, Your Highness. It is indeed a pleasure, Mr. Kelsey. I have been looking forward to this for a long time, Count. Yes, indeed. Uh, and Mr. Uh, uh... A Stoll. A Randolph Stoll, Squire. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. The Count de Didio. Uh, Mr. Stone is a journalist. Well met, Mr. Stone. Well met. I uh, have always admired the gentlemen of the Fourth Estate. To hold a mirror to our life and times is a profession requiring uh, discretion, understanding, and perhaps the ability to uh, uh, say less than one knows. Why, Count Raphael, you're a philosopher. Yes, I, uh, I see what you mean, Your Highness. Uh, silence, even uh, for a journalist, can be golden, Mr. Stone. Yes, golden. It can also be yellow. Oh. Oh, I see Commodore and Mrs. Dwight Friedenberg have just arrived. Will you excuse me, please? I'll bring them over. All right, what goes on here? What's the idea? Randy, please. I'm paying him well for this. Uh, will you join me in a bit of punch, Randy? If uh, his highness will excuse us. But, of course. All right. <laughs> Come on, have a glass of punch, Stone. It isn't too bad. You won't get away with it. Not after the morning edition. <laughs> After tonight's stone, the more you expose me, the better I like it. You know, it occurs to me that I should have invited you here in the first place. Your present fits very nicely. What are you trying to do? <laughs> Teach my wife a lesson. Mm, oh, come on, I do say. Have, have some fun. No, thank you. I've already tasted it. My dear blue-blooded wife will get the lesson of her life. Kelsey, why don't you see a psychiatrist? <laughs> you do need a drink, old boy. Yeah. Is there a real Count de Gideo? I suppose there must be. Naturally. He was due to be here tonight, but I received a wire at my office saying that his plane was grounded en route from Miami, Lisbon, and Point C. Uh -huh. So, not wishing my dear wife to be disappointed. Oh, Charles. Yes. Oh, I'm afraid the Count isn't feeling very well. Oh, dear, I suppose it has been an awfully hard trip. He has to leave. Oh, that's too bad. I'm sorry. Where is he? In the hall. I've had Perkins bring him his things. Oh, it really is too bad with the evening so young. Max was getting into a big black limousine as I ran down the stairs to the driveway. I called to him, Max! The car door slammed shut. The uniformed chauffeur threw the limousine into gear and spun away as I reached the side of the car. I was about to turn and go back into the house to question Kelsey when I saw the car circle the driveway and stop at the servant's entrance. As I hurried over, Max was getting out and was stripping off his overcoat. Oh, Max, now don't tell me that Kelsey wants that outfit back before you go. Randy. What goes on? If you must know, I, I am going to help in the kitchen. In the kitchen? Yes, yes, the kitchen. Are you satisfied? But why? What for? For a hundred dollars. A hundred? How much did you get for playing the count? Also a hundred. But I don't get it until I earn the second hundred dollars. But why? Why would he pay a hundred dollars for a dishwasher? I don't know, I don't know. But I've got to do it, Randy. I need the money. You might as well know it. Now go away, please. Let me get it over with. Okay, Max. But you'll get it over with a lot faster with an understudy to assist you. An understudy? Yeah, me. Come on. So this was the payoff. This was the booby trap. I couldn't help feeling it was even meaner than it looked, and I wanted to be around to try to keep it from exploding. We went around and back the servants' entrance and stepped into the kitchen. Servants had evidently been briefed by Kelsey, but they said not a word. They asked no questions. They just stared at us and whispered a little to each other. A stout old dame pointed to the pile of dishes in the sink. Them there. Thank you. Uh, what about an apron, Max? You can't wash dishes in that dress suit without... I've a... got to, just as I am, it's part of the agreement. I won't kid you, Randy. I've got to do this. It's vital. My wife and I, we've been starving. Ah, uh, you don't, don't have to tell me. Look, when Kelsey decides to get even, he doubles it in spades. We grabbed a couple of dish mops and went to work. Max laughed silently to himself as he worked, silently and bitterly. He turned to me. A king to account to a scullery boy in one short day. A breathless descent, eh, Randy? For my door, you're still king, Max. Thank you, lad. I, a king. You made me glory in my state deposed, but not me griefs. I'm still king of those. Oh, I dropped off. Forget about it. What's another dish to Kelsey? There I lie like a broken plate, used briefly and then... Life is short, Randy, so short. So what? It's not the length, but the performance that counts, and you were always great, Max, always. You're a kind wag, my lad, a veritable squire of the night, a minion of the moon. We're the moon's lovers, you and I, Randy, governed by her as is the sea, for our fortunes do ebb and flow like the ocean's tides, now up, 
Now down. Well, that's life, Max. It's like sitting in the aisle seat in the movies. Past the cleanser. By heaven, I'll hate you everlastingly if you bid me be of comfort anymore. I am barren, bereft of friends. But you're not, Max. I have lost the name of king. May jewels are a set of tawdry beads. May place a verminous hermitage. May rich apparel a beggar's garb. Oh, make foul weather with despised tears. Curse heaven and die. Oh, he's falling to pieces. I've got to get him out of here before the hall. <laughs> right in here, ladies and gentlemen. Tycoons, barons, and literary lions. Here. Here's the surprise I told you about. Y'all say stay out of here. <laughs> Both of you as he frees. Freeze. <laughs> there he is. Your nobleman from Spain, your aristocrat, the Count Raphael de Guidio in person. <gasps> Count Raphael, what's the meaning of this? Charles. <laughs> this is the silk purse, my dear. The one you keep telling me cannot be made for Masao's ear. Well, look at it. The sow's ear that you were convinced was the silk purse I never could become. Your born gentleman. The kind of gentleman I never could be. Oh, no, I'm not good enough. Well, meet him. <laughs> How goes it, Count? When you're through with those dishes, come out and give these hypocrites some more samples of your wits and gentility. Look at him, Edith. Look. Your gentleman. My hired clown. Oh, you... You're <laughs> Oh, you weak-minded phony. Only thing you proved is that Black says a gentleman compared to you... you... Viper damned beyond redemption. Max, take it easy. Snake whom we warmed with our hearts' blood. Spotted Judas. Keep away from me. Will ye bring Max. calumny upon our fair name? I have... Max, a... don't no, come. Ah. Get away. Get away. Let me down. But it wasn't, Max. Someone else, a giant, a king with a face of iron. Let go. Help. Oh, put him down, Max. Put him down. I'll make a soldier for your grinning skull. No, Max, don't. Put him down. When there are devils, tight the down. <laughs> Max had lifted him over his head and hurled him through the window to the street below. I clutched his arm and half-dragged, half-pushed him out of the door and down the stairs to the street. I got him into my car and we drove about for a while. He sat beside me, staring ahead lifelessly, as he had once before that night. The power and the majesty had gone out of him. He was just a tired old man once more, talking to himself without making a sound. I stopped in front of a drugstore. I got out and found a telephone. I dialed the Kelsey residence. Uh, who's talking? Sergeant Charles Inc., City Police. Who's this? Oh, uh, this Randy Stone. I just left there a little while ago. Uh, you I took Max Harrison with you. Yeah, that's right. He's with me now. Well, keep him there. Where are you? In front of a drugstore, corner of Maine and Flower. How is Kelsey? Was he hurt much? Yeah, he's dead. I went to the car and sat down beside Max. He looked at me with a strange new light on his bearded face. One that was tragic and far off. We have lost the name of kings. May golden cup becomes a dish of wood. Easy, Max. May one time kingdom a grave, a little grave, an obscure grave. Max, l listen to me. Can you understand what I'm saying? Nay, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. For death sits within the hollow crown that rounds our mortal temples and grins the buffoon, scoffing at our state... I, a king? <laughs> you have mistook me all the while. But I only live by bread like you, dear cuz, like you. Give me that man that is not fashion's slave, and I will wear him in my heart's core. I, in my heart, as I... He sat there beside me quoting Shakespeare. He didn't know me or hear me. I don't think he ever saw me. Once more. He was in another world. Once a world more. of his own dreams. I got I heard the siren of the approaching police car. And I know that though his body still lived, Max was gone. The king was dead. Well, the lights are winking out one by one from Clark Street with its flop houses to State Street with its glittering shops. Dawn is around the corner, bringing an end to sleep and to the dreams of those who walk by day and rest by night. Well, as Mr. Shakespeare himself once said, life itself is but a dream. 
If a dream are real, we only go through here once. Too bad we don't make more of it. Oh, well. Copy, boy. 